My name is Joel Towers, and I'm the uh, Executive Dean of Parsons, the New School for Design, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all here tonight. Um, on behalf of my colleague, uh, David Scobie, at the New School for Public Engagement, uh, in and the division that is um, sponsoring this event tonight, together with the uh, New School Sustainable Sustainability Advisory Committee, um, this is part of a week-long a series of events for Earth Week, and uh, it is our first Earth Week uh, celebration here at the New School, and so it's a, it's a real pleasure to have this group together, uh, particularly for the conversation tonight and on the subject matter that we first explored about a year ago uh, in this very room um, and uh, had a very lively conversation at the, the front end of a lot of the um, discussions in New York about uh, fracking. And so uh, this is really a second conversation and one that um, I will frame tonight and then I will introduce our panelists and we will have um, a, a kind of exchange among the panelists and the audience and I hope you will please participate. Um, just a couple of thanks uh, to a few people who made it possible tonight, uh, Gwen Kilvert, uh, and Josh Cohen from the New School Sustainability Advisory Committee, uh, Pam Tillis, who you, uh, um, helps has organized everything here, um, and of course my friend Gene Gardner, who's uh, played a role in that. Everybody knows Gene and Gene's hat. Um, and uh, Gene asked me if I would moderate this panel um, this evening, and uh, put me in. And, and of course, when Gene asks me to do something, I always say yes, which is always a mistake. Um, but I haven't learned over all these years uh, because it's always something interesting and it's usually something challenging and, um, and it is something challenging to moderate a panel on fracking um, and to moderate a panel on fracking at the new school and to moderate a panel on fracking at the new school during Earth Week and to, to achieve the goal that uh, Jean uh, set out for me which is a kind of moderate discussion. Um, so how to do that? Uh, was the challenge, uh, and um, and I thought perhaps it would be good to maybe just frame this uh, from the particular, from my particular perspective, in that um, most of my own work over the course of the last couple of decades has been in the area of climate change, and um, those of us who uh, actively engage in that work um, have struggled to balance uh, what is often perceived as kind of neutral reporting about things uh, in which um, a very small percentage of um, those who question the science and or the validity of climate change are given an equal side of the discussion in the public um, arena. Uh, this is not a conversation like that, um, meaning that I'm not terribly interested in suggesting there are two equal sides to this question in this conversation. Um, I also think um, that, uh, and I thought it would be good to use by example um, the particular issue of nuclear power. Um, this is something that those of us who have been active in the environmental movement for, for many, many years have had um, strong opposition to and has recently, recently in the last decade or so, really um, driven a kind of wedge in the environmental uh, movement because many people see nuclear power as a necessary bridge to uh, a post-carbon uh, um, energy world, and uh, yet uh, it's, it has all of the, you know, lovely benefits of 10,000 years of radioactive waste, and when nuclear power plants go bad, they go bad in a very big way, um, and yet it has been a very compelling and I think interesting and important argument within the, uh, within our communities um, over the course of the last years, and I think it's a little bit more um, akin to that, which is to say, where, where is this issue of uh, fracking today, and what does it mean to our energy uh, future, which is the question we've been asked to talk about. And I thought that the only way that we could have a kind of compelling conversation that isn't just all of us standing up here and saying fracking is bad, um, is to look at this from a broader ecosystemic perspective, right? Which is to say, um, what are the things we know about fracking? What are the things we don't know but can assume about it, and what are the things we don't know and actually can't predict? 
Um, and how can we look at these from a, a, a somewhat broader perspective? So for example, the ecosystem I'm talking about, the sort of fracking ecosystem, if you will, is comprised of all sorts of different um, issues. There are economic issues, for example, um, to, that, that come into play. And so what do we know about the economics of fracking? Does it actually represent um, jobs and uh, economic growth? Um, and does it do so? A lot of our conversation has been about New York State. How do we look at it as a sector? What does it mean in Pennsylvania and other places? Um, what we know is that if you take natural gas out of the ground, it will be burned. And therefore, we will take one sequestered carbon source and put it up in the atmosphere. I think that's a pretty reasonable assumption. If we frack and we mine this stuff, it will be used. So I think that's uh, there's probably not much argument about that. We know that it's non-renewable as a form of energy. Um, is it, as natural gas, less bad? This is an interesting part of the debate. Um, some of that hinges on the kind of uh, risks associated with it, and some of those risks um, include feedback. There is actually someone up there that I'm looking at. I mean, this is not sort of a <laughs> heavenly <laughs> view. Right? <laughs> thank you, Gene. Um, thank you. Where was I? We were in the fracking ecosystem. Um, it, we know that uh, in New York State, at the very least, um, much of the natural gas sits uh, atop the watershed, and this represents a very particular risk to us, and I think that has galvanized a lot of our uh, conversation. We were talking, I was talking about less bad, the idea that um, uh, is natural gas less bad uh, as an energy source? And a lot of that has to do with the, um, the follow-on impacts of the removal of it from, through fracking. Um, so we know that, um, it, that natural gas burns cleaner than other than coal, for example. Um, but uh, what do we know about those other impacts? I think those are some assumption and some we can't entirely predict. Um, we, uh, we also know, um, or we, we um, can surmise, uh, that this will have impacts on, very significant impacts on uh, land, land use, um, the kinds of issues of um, the, the visual and natural landscape uh, if we are to um, significantly set up wells and, and um, mine for natural gas uh, through fracking. Um, and uh, we, we don't, so the, I'm trying to give you a sense of the things that are, that constitute an ecosystem, not simply the act itself, right? So there's all of these different component parts. The question for me, uh, and I think for our panel, um, is if we take into account, and I'm gonna ask them all to speak both to their specific expertise, uh, but also to the broader question, which is if we take into account all of these different factors um, and others, have we increased or decreased the overall resilience of the system in which we are um, functioning, that we're living in. Um, and I think, to me, this is really the only way for us to address this question, because um, in the narrowest sense, the challenges of fracking are extreme. Um, what are the regulatory frameworks necessary will be one of the interesting points for us to look at. Um, but I don't think it can be taken outside of the broader energy context, because that's where the debate has, has um, largely uh, raged from the perspective, I think, of the industry. And then the risks associated environmentally have been, um, and uh, in terms of land settlement, land patterns, and so forth, have been where we, where m many people have responded to it. So I think um, what I'm trying to set up here is a somewhat more nuanced conversation on how we can figure out a reasonable answer to this question. A um, couple of thoughts just, and then I will turn it over to our first panelists. The question of less bad and of the burning of natural gas. I was reminded the other day, I had the, uh, was at a very interesting meeting um, in uh, um, One Bryant Park uh, with the Durst organization. And I was reminded of a decision that they had made when they built Four Times Square, uh, which was the, the, really the first environmentally advanced uh, skyscraper in New York City. And they, they put a, a fuel cell into that building. 
which everybody at the time was talking about hydrogen fuel cells. It was like, you know, you, you couldn't go anywhere without somebody talking excitedly about the potential of a hydrogen fuel cell, but they couldn't get hydrogen to power the thing because you can't get hydrogen <laughs> in New York City to power a fuel cell, and you certainly couldn't do it then. Um, so it's a natural gas-powered fuel cell. It's a very interesting question, right? Did, did, they did something very interesting by looking at on-site uh, generation. They did uh, electrical generation. Um, they did something, I think, really very innovative, uh, unique within the New York City uh, landscape. And yet we look at it um, today and we see they're still um, you know, burning a fossil fuel to produce energy through this fuel cell. So how do we ask this question of ourselves? What time frame uh, are we in? Um, when you look at the building I was in, one Bryant Park, their most recent project, it is very advanced in ways that four times square couldn't have been um, because it was constrained by the time and the conditions in which it was built. And I think some of this logic of where we are in this particular timescape is connected to this notion that I started off with of bridge fuels and, and so forth. Um, of course, it's not nearly as good as if we ran everything on solar and wind. And you know, we are, my colleague Ashok has got a great uh, campaign going, uh, working with New York State on the, uh, the Solar Jobs uh, Act and, um, and moving those kinds of initiatives forward. So it's, there's, it's not that there aren't alternatives that are very good. The question is, what is the role of this in this overall ecosystem? And so I thought that would be the way for us to frame this conversation. And I sent a shorter version of that to our panelists a few days ago so that they would be prepared for that. Uh, that discussion. So let me, um, having teed that up a little bit, introduce our panelists um, at one time and then they will speak uh, each for 10 or so, 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll have a conversation. Um, and so we will go in the following order. We will start with uh, Al Appleton, who is a senior fellow at the Cooper Union Institute for Sustainable Design and an adjunct associate professor at Cooper Union, where he teaches an advanced concept seminar on sustainability and economics. During the 90s, Appleton served as Commissioner of New York City Department of Environmental Protection and Director of the New York City Water and Sewer System. He will be followed by Hilary Baum, who is the President and Founder of the Baum, uh, Baum Forum, the Public Market, uh, Public Market Partners. Baum produces educational conferences and special events focusing on critical food and farming issues. As a founding coordinator, director of Food Systems Network New York City and the Public Market Collaborative, Baum has long been involved in the development of farmers and public markets, agricultural marketing programs, and community-sponsored agriculture. Baum co-authored Public Markets and Community Revitalization. Ashok Gupta is the director of programs and the former director of the Energy Policy and senior energy economist at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Gupta specializes in global warming policy, energy efficiency, renewables, sustainable building design, smart growth, and transportation policy. He serves as NRDC's representative on Mayor Bloomberg's Sustainability Advisory Board and Energy Policy Task Force, and on the boards of directors of the Coalition for Environmentally Responsible Economies, the Alliance for Clean Energy for New York, and Citizens Union Foundation, as well as Greenlight New York. He received a USGBC 2007 Leadership Award for Advocacy, the Environmental Steward Award from Solar One 2006, Environmental Professional of the Year Award from the Association of Energy Engineers in 2003, and the 2001 Advocate, uh, Environmental Advo uh, Advocates um, Advocate Award, and a few other things. I'm gonna stop reading Ashok. <laughs> Uh, Hilary uh, Meltzer is the Deputy Chief of Environmental Law Division at the New York City Law Department. Meltzer has worked extensively with the city's Department of Environmental Protection on the potential effects for the public agencies and local stakeholders of hydraulic fracturing on New York City's drinking water supply. Her work involves a combination of litigation and counseling, dealing particularly with enforcement cases intended to protect against contamination in the upstate New York watershed. And then finally, uh, Lou Wright um, is uh, a student here, a senior in environmental studies at Eugene Lyon College, a new school for liberal arts. And he is active in the university's undergraduate environmental student organization called Renew School. And in Amp Up Youth Summit, uh, Bill McKimmitt's 350.org and local anti-fracking uh, activities. Um, and uh, Lou will actually lead off our questions um, 
uh, after the panelists uh, start. So we're going to start with you, Al. Um, uh, the microphone is yours. We, I thought we could speak from the, from the, unless you want to come up. Yeah, I think we'll speak from here. And I, Hillary, when you're ready, I'll put your panel. Here's a All right. Well, some of the things that didn't get mentioned, uh, I did the Casco Watershed Protection Program, and worldwide I consult on the economics of sustainable development and on landscape protection so that the, the gas fracking issue with its impacts on the landscape is of huge interest to me. But let me talk about the broader energy context. Um, <clears throat> the broader energy context is a long history of this country with fossil fuel. <clears throat> and it's important to understand that the world we live in today is a world fossil fuel created. I mean, the birth date of this world is 1765 when James Watt invented the reciprocating steam engine but all of Mr. Watt's wonderful engines needed fuel. Wood would have never done the trick. Nature gave us, you know, fossil carbon. Um, so fossil carbon for 250 years, burning it has been the way to prosperity and it's been the way to wealth. We've created a lot of institutions to capture it. These institutions um, are deeply embedded in the political and economic structure of our country. Um, and there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of social expectations about them. The biggest social expectation, of course, is that fuel should be cheap. Um, you know, we have a presidential campaign that may turn on the price of gasoline at the pump. Um, we have economic analysts who wonder if the rising price of oil is going to kill the recovery. Um, there is a social belief that we should have cheap fuel. This actually is not the belief of Mr. Smith and Wealth of Nations. Mr. Smith argued for, few, for goods that had the right price, you know, prices based on all their true costs, um, which clearly fossil fuel does not have. But when we come to talk about fracking, and it's interesting in these debates to see many um, political leaders and industry leaders you know, suggest that the people who want to ban fracking are engaged in some kind of social heresy. It is clear that in the, the broader energy context or the overall ecosystem, um, there's an expectation that if it's an energy resource, it will be exploited. Um, so the question then becomes whether that's a good idea. Now, much of the fracking debate has been attempted by the media and the gas industry to be steered into kind of a classic environmental structure of here's this thing, here's this economically beneficial thing called progress and how much environmental damage are we willing to put up to, you know, to harvest it. The, so that if you see a lot of the debate and you look at a lot of the environmental organizations that have attempted to dance with wolves in my, uh, favorite metaphor, there's basically a belief that what we have to do is strike a balance, a balance between, you know, the, the need to protect the environment from the consequences of gas fracking, the benefits we can get from, quote, abundant natural gas. The industry never stops trumpeting these um, benefits, and many of them are designed to pull, to pull levers in your political consciousness. Energy security, which has been on the American agenda since the 1970s, is a big one. It is, we are somehow fighting terrorists and we are somehow helping our own prosperity if we produce our own energy. Um, this is an, a fundamental element of the natural gas industry's pitch, even though they are now talking about exporting natural gas and how that contributes to energy security is a little dubious to me. Um, but, so this is the first question, is this really a balance issue? And to this issue, I wish to say that I believe any person sitting at this table could write some regulations that on paper would protect the environment from gas fracking. Um, but as, to quote one of my favorite you know, passages from Shakespeare, um, Henry IV, part one, Glendower and Hotspur are arguing, Glendower says to Hotspur, beware, for I can summon demons from the fiery depths. Hotspur looks back at him and says, well, so can I, and so can he, and so can any other man, but will they come when you call them? Um, the truth of the matter is about regulating gas fracking is whether the industry will play ball 
with it. And the, all the evidence is they will not. And all the evidence is that the government simply will not have the spine to enforce the kinds of draconian regulations that would be needed to protect the environment from this highly dangerous activity. Now, I created a regulatory system for the city of New York up in the watershed. I had to fight off a lot of real estate developers. I have some knowledge of what's involved in regulation. It's not a pretty picture, as uh, they said in Aladdin. Um, basically, I, ca I cannot envision, assuming the DC for New York State, for example, is willing to do what they should do in terms of supervising the drilling of casings, leaks from which are one of the main environmental problems, which is to place an on-site inspector on site. I have a lot of trouble seeing the DC is going to allow that inspector to tell the gas company to shut down a $12 million operation, because that's about what it costs to drill a fracking job. I have a lot of trouble seeing in the real world DEC telling an agency who's been told by wherever they were disposing of their fracking fluid that we can't take it anymore, um, you've got to quit fracking until you find a new place to do this with, the, with that fracking operation counting the money they are going to lose. The truth of the matter is these are very expensive investments in these drills and I, do, I quite frankly from my own experience, um, and my experience was actually pretty good, but I had a mayor who was pretty you know, committed to this. Um, I have a great deal of trouble and looking at Pennsylvania and Arkansas and Texas, um, looking at Wyoming and Colorado, I see all of this kind of born. I have a great deal of trouble seeing an, a state regulator um, who is politically committed to this industry telling these people they have to write off $10 million investments because they're not meeting an environmental standard. Um, I also look at the way the industry has reacted to undisputable evidence of its own environmental misconduct. There has been no good neighbor policy, no good neighbor philosophy. These are people who have bitterly fought, you know, with essentially mis misleading arguments, um, any attempt to regulate them. The um, it's, again, it's, if you want to go back and look at the debate that took place in the Pennsylvania State Legislature this spring when the Republicans rammed through essentially frack we must for this is our motto and our cause is just bill that wiped out home rule safeguards, um, stream buffer protections, um, safeguards for state forests. Um, this is not an industry that believes in being an environmental good neighbor. This is not an industry, to be frank, that I know of any instance where anybody has been promoted into a higher management position because they were successfully dealt with communities and the environment. This, is not, this industry is not 3M, it is not in Swiss Re, it is not Toyota, it is not DuPont, it is not even Walmart. Um, this is an industry who's, you know, that is not setting out to deliberately pollute, but is an industry that only cares about getting the product out. And if that leads to pollution, then this is an industry that through long experience in the United States has seen the public accept a certain amount of environmental damage for the supposed benefits of fossil fuel. So I think the first thing that needs to be shot down is that we are not dealing with a question of balancing the environment versus the economy. There is no balance in this discussion, unfortunately. I wish there was. I have sat through many meetings with senior executives of natural gas companies. I even spoke at a forum in Alberta and met a, a whole bunch of them. Um, they don't get it. Um, you know, they have excuses for the opposition, they call it NIMBY, they call it anecdotal, they call it hysterical. Um, they say people don't understand America needs cheap energy. Um, uh, there's a long variety of slogans. Now, the second question is the benefits of this are highly suspect. Let me take, I'll take the environment, I'll take the environmental, the larger energy context second, but I first want to take the decision that New York has to make on its environmental impact statement. Supposedly the argument for authorizing gas fracking in New York is that there will be many economic development benefits to the state of New York. This quite frankly suggests to me that the people in charge of our economic destiny can't add 
and have never heard of the concept of due diligence. Um, now, when I say they can't add, this is an industry that if you read the industry literature, is losing money. Um, at the price of $1.80 a TCF, they are essentially burning through cash flow to drill these wells, which they are doing for corporate reasons, you know, and to maintain the integrity of their leases and their balance sheets. I would like someone to explain to me how an industry that losing money is going to be an engine of economic growth for the state of New York. Secondly, we know that this is an industry that would impose enormous costs on the public. For example, um, New York State Department of Transportation prepared a private analysis that showed that the damage to state and local roads yearly from the truck traffic associated with gas fracking is over $200 million a year. That's not a cost that the gas fracking industry proposes to pay. If you go read the 10Ks of companies like Chesapeake or Cabot, you will see that their liability insurance totals something like $450 million statewide. Now, if you have any you know, experience with Superfund or the kinds of accidents that can ha happen with these fracking activities, you know that's a ridiculously small number. We also know that the industry does not really have a reliable place to dispose of its waste fracking fluid, contaminated as it is with chemicals, radioactivity, heavy metals from the shale that it comes up. Um, so they are essentially counting upon a regulatory bailout for this. Um, but worst of all, we have seen in places like Pennsylvania and elsewhere that gas fracking so blights the landscape that it essentially you know, destroys the value of any adjacent property that has not been leased for gas fracking. There are really sad stories when you go upstate at community meetings from people who have sunk their life savings into retiring into what they thought was going to be a quiet rural community to live the rural life of their dreams and discovered that they have lost 90% of their property value and they cannot get household insurance. Um, there are, similar, there are similar stories with respect to people who have signed gas leases and have then learned that the conditions of these leases are inconsistent with their mortgages, so that if the bank ever wants to pull the trigger on them, they are at the mercy. The FHA has rules of extens not extending FHA mortgage uh, funding to lands and dwellings that are within a certain distance of gas fracking operations. So in short, this is an industry that would suck an enormous amount of value out of the state of New York. Value in terms of infrastructure damage, value in terms of law enforcement, value in terms of adjacent property, value in terms of unmet environmental costs that the public will have to eat. Um, this is not a development plan for the state of New York. This is, if I may quote a phrase, the undevelopment plan for upstate New York. There's a, there is a reason why everybody in Cooperstown, save a handful of large landowners, is bitterly opposed to gas fracking. And I submit to this audience that regulations that would allow a gem such as Cooperstown and its tourist industry, its museums, its Hall of Fame to be blighted uh, by gas fracking, not to mention the pollution in Lake Otsego, um, the, the implications of this for, quote, economic development speak for themselves. Now, in terms of the larger energy context, um, the gas fracking people like to say natural gas is a transition element. That's actually they have dropped lately as they talk about a 100-year supply of natural gas, a claim the USGS has shot down. It's also a claim they have dropped as they petition the Department of Energy for liquid natural gas facilities to export this stuff. But the truth of the matter is a transition to what? What is the energy future we want? There are lots of people, and I actually ran through this exercise in my own class two weeks ago, who will tell you that the only way we are going to do anything about global warming is we have to get out of burning fossil fuel in a hurry. Um, and technically, we are capable of doing this. There is a, a myth that green energy is an immature industry that we, you know, we cannot go forward with it. I would like to give you a little story from American history. In 1940, the country had 10% unemployed, 10% underemployed, and an army that was 19th in the world, ahead of Bulgaria but behind Portugal. 
Five years later, the United States had an armed force of 12 million men that was running over with so much equipment that the Germans ceased to keep records because it was too depressing. Um, in short, we the United States had then, and under the same conditions have now, the capability to do a mass reindustrialization of the country with respect to green energy. The problems are um, they're institutional, political, and financial. They are not technological. Now, when I was up in Alberta meeting with some of those natural gas executives, the one question that did, that did dent some of them a little bit was they said, we're about to invest you know, billions of dollars in developing shale gas fracking as our next energy industry. Assuming we have billions of dollars to invest, is this the next is this really the next energy industry we want? So that I submit that the challenge we face in front of us is to take the money that is being invested in shale gas fracking and figure out how to incentivize the green energy of the future. Um, this is not a plan, I believe, that is beyond the, the institutional or the financial ingenuity of the American people to solve. The difficulty, of course, is if you're a large oil corporation or if you're a large gas corporation, this is not a future that you could contemplate with you know, a great deal of comfort. Uh, these are very powerful institutions. We have failed to convince these institutions that if they want to stay to be the prime players in American energy, they should become the leaders in the transition to the energy economy of the future as opposed to the, the, energy, you know, the energy economy of the past. For that is what shale gas, natural gas, really is. And let's admit it, cheap natural gas has been very tempting to many people. I'm doing a project on forest restoration in California. The use of that biomass, um, which, you know, which should be backing out energy, is essentially fighting an uphill battle against very cheap natural gas, which the utilities are kind of, you know, trying to glom up. There's lots of studies that show that the, that the price of shale gas has depressed the prices for wind power, solar power, energy conservation buildings, the kind of building that we were talking about. So that, to the extent we are prepared, we are allowing this industry to be subsidized, you know, by the public environment, by public funding. Um, I don't, I'm not going to go into the taxation of the fossil fuel industry here, but it's certainly an interesting topic. Um, to the extent we are subsidizing it, we are essentially putting up roadblocks to our own energy future, a future that promises many things, such as improved public health, improved employment, um, and the reindustrialization of America. So. In the broader energy context, that's what shale gas represents. It represents an unsolvable environmental problem, it represents an undevelopment plan for any rural landscape, and it represents an enormous threat to the energy future we want to have. Now, the, the problem, as I said, is institutional and political. Exxon makes $55 billion in profits a year. So, the governor's people say, well, isn't cheap natural gas good? Um, well, we don't need shell gas, actually, to get cheap natural gas. This is the last dirty little secret of this industry. There's a boom in oil development, and oil is where we used to get most, you know, oil development is where we used to get most of our natural gas. The, the boom in oil development, because it is driven by real price increases, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your view of price and energy policy. The boom in oil development is generating a lot of natural gas. We don't need the environmental, social, and landscape costs of shale gas to get the advantages of cheap gas. What we will get if we continue to pursue shale gas is we're going to get an industry that will you know, move heaven and earth to try and export this gas because they get larger prices overseas where the price of gas is for public policy reasons linked to the price of oil. Um, and whether or not we want to sacrifice the New York environment or the public wealth of the state of New York to subsidize the, you know, the export of shale gas, I think is a question that answers itself. Um, I'll stop here and hopefully that will get us going. Yeah. <laughs> You want me to put the
this. Uh, sure. So, hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Um, Al just mentioned that the she, he referred to costs that the public is going to have to eat if we have fracking. But I'd really like to talk more about the food that the public has to eat right now and hopefully <laughs> will continue to eat in the future. Um, so what Joel really didn't mention is that I was up here about a year ago um, with Jean Gardner, Professor Jean Gardner. Is that better? Is it on? Is that better? I was here about a year ago, uh, standing up here with Joel and also with Professor Jean Gardner as we kicked off uh, a half-day conference um, on fracking that was called Water Fight, Food Fracking, I mean, I'm sorry, Water Fight, Fracking, Farming, Art, and the Economy. And um, I want to thank Joel and Jean and the people here at Parsons the New School again for having uh, let me work with them last year to plan that event. Um, obviously that we still have this problem with fracking and, um, and the work continues and that's what tonight is all about. But I thought it would be really important to let you know that uh, even though fracking has not yet been banned by the state of New York, um, in various parts of New York, parts or all of the fracking process and its byproducts have been banned um, by 95 towns in New York and six counties. Um, which I think is pretty incredible, represents over a million people um, throughout the state. I think Albany was the last um, or the most recent city to come on board to ban fracking. Um, in addition, fracking's been banned recently in France and in Bulgaria, and there are moratoriums in place in parts of South Africa and all of Quebec. So please put this in your consciousness that fracking can be banned, that it's not inevitable, as so many people would like us to think. Today, there are thousands of people and scores of organizations all over New York State uh, that are working together right this minute uh, to get the New York, New York State to actually ban fracking. Um, and as many of you know, the guy sitting over here to my right um, is one of the most outspoken people on this issue. And um, I just want to say, Al, what an inspiration you've been to so many people um, who are part of this fight, and also Rec uh, recognize your incredible work that you did do uh, much earlier in your career by actually giving this glorious gift to our region of a protected watershed. And we want to thank you for that. So in part, because we were given this gift and um, we really have something to fight for. And um, and I think it's also opened, opened up a lot of people's thinking and feeling for fighting for the rest of the state that could be affected by fracking. All the other watersheds and other parts of the state, waterways and lands that are potentially af affected by fracking and if not directly by fracking, by other kinds of environmental uh, devastation and degradation. So Al was really important actually in my development as a, uh, at this point, um, a tireless cartoon of a uh, anti-fracking person. Um, uh, he was at the first New York City program that I attended that was focused on this issue where presentations were made by environmental uh, professionals and also by a family that had come from Pennsylvania to let us all know about their contaminated uh, water uh, on their own property and actually brought samples of dirty water to make sure that we, we got it. Um, and this was at the end of uh, 2011. Um, but a couple of months, or I guess a couple of weeks before that event, um, I was at a conference in Albany. It was the a regional um, ag sustainable agriculture con conference. And while I was there, um, in the middle of the program, uh, when you know it was all focused on the future of sustainable agriculture in this actually 12-state region, um, a person actually at my table, you know, put up her hand and, and, and stood up and called out to the, to the group, how can you talk about the future of sustainable agriculture in New York? 
you guys don't understand the impact of fracking. You have to learn about fracking, and you also have to understand that a huge quantity, a huge portion of land in upstate New York, uh, around Cortland and other, and other areas on the Marcellus Shale has already been leased. And that includes also state lands where leases have already been written um, for fracking. Now, of course, we know that it's still not, this form of fracking that we're talking about is still not actually permitted in New York State. But that does not, but it belies the fact that there are huge number of leases. I don't know what the number is, but you can find a map and see how much land has actually uh, been put into leases already. So when Christine Applegate stood up and called out to all of us this warning about fracking, it really hit me really hard. Um, I really understood uh, as a food and farming activist for like 30 years what this could potentially mean. Um, I fell in love with the farmscape and landscapes of central New York um, as a young adult, uh, first at Cornell, and then not too many years later, uh, my partner and I moved up to Delaware County, uh, where we still are very close to friends up there, and uh, actually learned a lot about what was going on with the dairy industry um, at that time, and why there were some active cow pastures, and there were other pastures that were inactive. And it was actually during the time of, uh, I think, one or even two different dairy herd buyouts. Uh, when the dairy farmers in the, in the area were feeling so much pressure uh, to get out because of various um, very unfair pricing policy and other kinds of related policy that was coming from uh, the federal government. Um, with my experience uh, and my learning about all of this, uh, with this kind of background, I got really kind of panicky and started thinking about all the farms that are on the, on the shale uh, in New York State, on the Marcellus Shale, and then the other boundaries of shale beyond that. Um, and you can see behind me that um, the, the Marcellus Shale is over many, many uh, uh, states and takes up a very big portion of New York State, primarily the southern tier. Anyway, this was the moment for me, this was how I entered this issue, uh, was through my years as a, as a food and farming advocate, and um, then once I heard Al with, Al being Al, and the other people on the panel, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't turn back. I was totally hooked, and I was really on fire, and I was trying to figure out what would be my, my contribution to this fight, what could I do? And, I have been producing um, conferences and seminars on critical food and farming issues for many years, and I realized that the most important thing I could do would be to bring sort of the food movement people, the food community um, of my professional world into the discussion with the environmentalists and the other anti-fractivists -frac um, in one space to exchange ideas and to start to enlist the food community in the fight against fracking. And so the vision of that became my path uh, to last year's conference here. And through that conference, I also developed a lot of, uh, first of all, a lot of relationships with, I think we had about 30 co-sponsors that represented organizations from all over the state that had already been very involved in fracking uh, act or anti-fracking activity and educational activities. Um, but also through this, um, a couple of chefs had come together to help us plan the uh, food event that we had here, which uh, was actually very out of the ordinary because usually you can't do things like that at this school, it was to bring food from outside. Um, and so we had a lot of food from the Marcellus that was represented at our, um, at our uh, gathering after the event. But it was through the relationships that were built in putting together that spread, that we came up with this idea of launching a, a, a campaign that would be specifically directed to food professionals. So we did. We started, um, a few months later, uh, we started a group called Chefs for the Marcellus, and the idea is to enlist professional purchasers of regionally produced food and beverages 
into the fight against fracking. Um, and so we've been at this for a while now, and um, it was planning, actually, the, this map occurred in preparation for the conference that we had last May. And as you can see on the map behind me, there are a lot of green dots representing green market farmers um, all over that, or in several parts of that map. But in particular, there are at least somewhere between 35 and 45 farms that actually fall on the Marcellus Shale. And um, these are just farmers from the green market program, but there are hundreds and maybe even thousands of additional farmers on the shale just in New York State. Now, some of these farmers you probably know, you probably buy from them, um, possibly at Union Square Market or other markets in the green market system. Um, but they're not necessarily, they're, they're not necessarily going to let you know that they're <laughs> on the shale. So, um, but we've been uh, working as part of part of our work to kind of discover who they are. And we have recently found out, because we're planning another event, um, so we actually know where they are and have not decided exactly what we're going to do with that information, to tell you the truth. But, um, but my, my question really to you is, you know, where is your entry going to be into this issue? Um, I found mine pretty quickly uh, through my particular feel for the for the state, really, for central New York, for the farmers, and all the work that I've been doing, and also because I like to eat, and I am thrilled about what's going on with local food in general, um, in terms of its availability. But, you know, when I was preparing for tonight, I was thinking, oh, well, who's the audience tonight? <laughs> Is it going to be, like, students? Is it people who already are involved with this issue? Um, you know, I just feel so strongly that, um, we have to each individually find our own way to enter into, into this, whether it's through renewables, through climate change, through issues that relate to public health, environmental justice, the green econ economy, or through the Occupy movement. But I really feel strongly that once you find your way in, you're going to develop your vision for what you're going to personally do to contribute to, to prevent fracking from happening in New York State. Um, one of the most important things I've learned from Al is about thinking about these myths. And he mentioned several myths tonight. One of the myths that I'd like to talk about um, that is a very popular um, subject or part of the argument for why these um, uh, poor, you know, why farmers should uh, sign leases is there is this belief that agriculture is pretty dead in New York State. And um, I think it's really important to understand that it's not dead, that it is, uh, there is a huge portion of the state where we have many hundreds of farmers um, all over the state uh, who are very engaged in ag economic um, enterprise. And um, I think that it's very, very important that we recognize this issue of resiliency uh, in, the, in the food system as it's being kind of uh, reinvented as it's being regionalized and localized. That's where the resiliency is. And also, when we talk about ecology, I can't help but think of, of, of this particular part of the food system as, as, having, an, you know, as, as having an ecology of its own. Um, the, there definitely are many poor, poor farmers in New York State. But I think it's important to understand that the reason they're probably the probable reason they're poor is because they they're really they became victims of the conventional food system, which is a which is basically a broken system, and it's those people that have been able to move out of that into um, alternative marketing and uh, different ways of uh, distributing their foods that have really started to make a huge dent um, in the economy and in New York State. So as many of you know, the demand for fresh local food has skyrocketed all over the state. Um, there are about five, over 500 farmers markets now throughout New York State. And um, at many of these markets, uh, people from uh, different parts, from the lower income community, have been able, are able now to redeem their uh, SNAP benefits and their WIC um, 
coupons and so forth through the farmers markets. And I know there's, we should all know there's a very big fight right now to uh, preserve those benefits, which are very threatened uh, by things that are going on budget-wise in, in DC right at the moment. But all over the stores, in addition to these farmers markets, of course, there are tons of co-ops and specialty food stores and even some supermarkets that are purchasing millions of dollars worth of New York produce, meats, and dairy and all other kinds of institutions and schools and so forth where, um, and restaurants and bars especially, where they're boasting of their relationships with particular farmers from different parts of the state, uh, whether they're farmers or vintners, cheesemakers, and of course brewers, and brewers are very, very popular uh, here in New York City. Some of the most, out, one of the most outspoken businesses against fracking is Brewery Omegang in Cooperstown. Um, a huge percentage of New York State's close to $4 billion uh, in the ag economy, a um, huge percentage of that, it, there are estimates that almost half of it are in fact derived from the 28-county region that is sitting on the Marcellus Shale. Um, so I just want to say again that New York State agriculture is not dead, but fracking can, can really kill it, it can destroy property values and livelihoods and permanently damage the landscape and our sustenance. Um, healthy farming needs abundant supplies of clean water, clean air, and clean soil. And it needs land that is not fragmented by drilling pads, pipelines, and compressors. It needs a critical mass of acreage and farming nearby and the infrastructure that would accompany it. And it needs to be free of the stigma that may be attributed to food sourced from areas where fracking will take place. Even if individual farmers are not fracking, there is tremendous concern that there will be uh, a loss of consumer confidence um, in food and of course uh, water coming from this region. So um, our campaign is based on this idea that fracking presents a totally unacceptable risk to New York City's regional uh, food shed. And um, I think that uh, many of the people who are joining our campaign are certainly people who um, do consider themselves part of the food movement in that they, they have made a point of purchasing local food and supporting local farmers um, in their, through their businesses. Um, but I want to say that also that the food, food movement has been facing rigidity and control in the conventional food system for many decades. And we've made um, a lot of progress. And it is alive, and it is a resilient movement. Um, the movement has built back diversity in mar into marketing options for producers, such as farmers markets, CSAs, and direct wholesaling, and has inspired farm to school and farm to institution programs, government procurement programs, even here in New York City. Um, programs that support the development of new and immigrant farmers, and agricultural economic development initiatives that build capacity and infrastructure. And um, these are, you know, are all contributing to creating a really promising and hopeful new ag economy um, for our state. So I think we should really, you know, savor this local food, but also realize what's at stake and how important it is to protect these uh, these, these sources. Um, I think that uh, we all need to be part of the of a community that is responding to the threat of fracking, and um, forums like this are certainly uh, places to uh, raise awareness and inspire action. Um, I just wanted to read a quote. Um, from Francis and Anna, Anna LaPay, which is that hope is not where, what we find in evidence, it's, it is what we become in action. Um, unfortunately, I didn't bring my very last slide, which was gonna give you a couple of opportunities for action. Um, and I have flyers that I left in the outside there, uh, outside the doors on the, but I think it's really, un, really important for people to know that on May 3rd at noon, there is going to be a demonstration outside of the governor's office, um, and there are flyers to that effect, so everybody please come, and that's going to be part of a statewide day, day of action. Also, on a regular basis, some organizations want you to call Cuomo on Mondays, and some of them want you to call Cuomo on Fridays, but whenever you can, you should please call Cuomo and tell him to ban fracking. 
and his number is 866-961-3208. And lastly, um, our organization is having a, uh, a, an event on Sunday, and I have flyers about that. But please check out uh, our new, a new statewide coalition called New Yorkers Against Fracking. Fa fantastic website. We have a lot of resources also on our, our site, which is, which is chefsformarcellus.org. Thank you. I think this is on, great. Uh, first of all, thank you, Joel, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, and, uh, and it's, of course, great to be on this panel with all my friends and colleagues here. Uh, I think many of us go back a long ways. Al, it's good to see you. I think it's been 20 years and uh, more, counting, and Joel, you too, as well. So I uh, look forward to this conversation. I'm gonna keep my remarks pretty sh brief because I want to really have this conversation about uh, really what we do in, in STAT in terms of, uh, you know, what, how do we really scale up the solutions that we want and how challenging it is, it is to actually get the renewable industry scaled up as quickly as we all want. And so a lot of my time is spent on energy efficiency and wind and offshore wind and solar and, and you know, we still only have very small penetration of those uh, those solutions and uh, we need to figure out uh, jointly those who you know are uh, very actively and effectively uh, engaged in the natural gas battle to really also uh, use their voice and megaphone to be in favor of some of the solutions that are pending at the state legislature so I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the work we've been doing on solar and other topics. I think the, and I just got back from China about a week ago, and uh, and when you, what you notice when you're uh, there uh, is, of course, the huge appetite for energy and the huge growth in demand for energy all over the world. I mean, we have, of course, here for a long time been indulging in overconsumption of energy and wasting you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 percent of it at the same time. So we multiply the impacts that all of our consumption has because of the waste, but it is this appetite for energy. We all use it, we all want it, we all need it, and we all want it to be cheap. Maybe not all, but most of us, many of us, and certainly the political system is uh, is really behind this idea that it has to be abundant and cheap and how we move from the current system to a better and different system is the challenge and is what you know many of us have been trying to do but it has uh, so far not been effective in making that transition away from coal and natural gas and nuclear uh, it to uh, to a more renewable system so uh, that, I think, is the biggest challenge that we face. The opportunities are huge. I mean, I think it has to start with energy efficiency. I think the fact that uh, if people care about uh, wanting energy to be affordable, then wasting 20, 30 percent or more is really illogical because that is money that's totally being wasted and it is causing huge impacts. And, and we continue to, in terms of our building design and transportation and every other way, not take advantage of solutions and opportunities that exist today. And uh, so, if you know, at NRDC, we you know, I must have 20 to 30 colleagues who spend their time entirely on promoting more energy efficient use in terms of buildings and transportation sector and and we can do much, much more, and we're not making all the progress we can and should, and the ability to kind of, you know, reform the utility sector, do better building codes and standards, use market strategies uh, to really improve the way we use energy. So the idea that, you know, we can be generating all this electricity and waste 20, 30 percent, 
the, you know, all the natural gas that we're wasting, even natural gas used in power plants. I mean, some of our older power plants uh, use only 20 or 30 percent of the fuel, and the rest of it is basically not used efficiently. New power plants are 50, 60 percent uh, in terms of their utilization. Combined heat and power gets you to 80, 90 percent. So the idea that we use valuable resources and, that have huge impacts and are wasting, uh, you know, so much of it is just, to me, uh, you know, makes no sense and it is uneconomic and we are all, you know, we all have to do something about it and really focus on it. And I, and I think part of the political challenge is really how to you know, organize and how to make that happen. It's not, uh, it's hard to get people organized to be for certain things, like for energy efficiency or even for renewables. I think that's been, you know, it's, it's uh, we can come back to that and have that conversation in terms of why that's the case. Uh, in terms of renewables, uh, again, we've, you know, incrementally added more renewables in New York. You know, a thousand megawatts of wind has been added in the last five years. That's good. Uh, a lot of the wind is upstate. But the challenge then is how do you, you know, what's, what do we need to do in terms of transmission to bring it downstate? There is a lot of wind offshore. We need to kind of get some agreement from folks that people are not opposed to offshore wind. If we want to, you know, we need to kind of figure that out, be supportive of it. It's going to take a huge investment. It's going to take time, but it is closer to market, and we should be really scaling up our efforts on offshore wind in this market if we really want to move away from fossil fuels. And I think, uh, you know, I think we've barely started down that path in terms of organizing in favor of offshore wind. Uh, on solar, that an area where we've spent a lot of time on in the last couple of years, and you know we're uh, uh, we you know we have been we have, there's legislation to have 5,000 megawatts of solar uh, over a 15-year period, uh, which actually just just matches what New Jersey is already committed to doing, and we're a much bigger state. Uh, you know, we've been at it for two years. That legislation is still very difficult to pass. Uh, and if there was something that I would ask people to do immediately, it would be kind of even in the next, you know, four, six, eight weeks before the legislature goes home, would be at least send a very strong message that instead of more natural gas, we should be supporting more solar in New York State. And I think that would be a, you know, a step. It's not, you know, in the right direction. And, uh, but I don't think the, you know, the elected leaders are hearing uh, as loudly what people are for here as an alternative to natural gas. I think all, everybody here, I'm sure, is in support of more solar, but it does not get the attention and it, the voices are not heard in terms of that support. So that would be very, very good. The other thing to keep in mind, of course, in the energy debate in New York uh, is, of course, the issue of Indian Point and how in concert, uh, while we want to, of course, move away from coal and also natural gas. We also are, in, you know, very interested in, in not having Indian Point be relicensed, and that's coming, that decision is coming up in the next two to three years as well. And to be able to replace the energy from Indian Point is also part of the challenge uh, in the near term, and it requires even, you know, redoubling our efforts in terms of what we're doing on, on renewables and energy efficiency. Uh, so, I mean, I, you know, we can have, we should discuss all of this in terms of really how, in my view, along with uh, opposing the use of fossil fuels, we also do everything we can to really help promote and scale up the solutions that we all know are necessary if we're going to uh, you know, avoid the environmental harms and also meet our energy needs uh, in, you know, in the years and decades to come. So I think that's kind of how I want to kind of frame my comments and look forward to the conversation. Thank you.
So I apologize for actually making you bear with slides, but um, I actually find maps really helpful. Um, and what, oh dear. I'm sorry. Um, I have a much easier job than any of the previous panelists because I'm a lawyer and I have a client and I get to just represent my client's interests here. Um, I am interested in the broader issues um, and in energy policy, but it's not actually my job. <coughs> Instead, uh, my client is the City of New York and uh, the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, and I work primarily on our water supply. Um, I, I think it's worth just taking a moment and looking at the map, and I have a few maps here to, to show what we're talking about, but we deliver about uh, 1.1 billion gallons a day to half the population of New York from a 2,000 square mile watershed. Um, most of it, 1,600 square miles, is in the west side of the Hudson River, the Catskill and, water, and Delaware water systems, and um, thanks largely to Al's vision from 20 years ago, the um, system is unfiltered. Thank you. Um, it's the largest unfiltered surface water supply in the nation, and it produces water of exceptional quality. Um, given what this system does for us, um, even if the risks to the system from fracking are relatively low. Um, the size of the system, the nature of the system, the importance of the system, our tolerance for that risk has to be just as low. Um, so what happened when we learned about fracking, we, I'm now thinking of the city, um, in the summer of 2008, is a lot of people said, you know, fracking shouldn't happen in the New York City watershed, um, which entirely overlies the shale. So <coughs> the yellow area on this slide is the Marcella Shale in New York. The red boundary shows the Catskill Delaware water, <coughs> watershed. Um, the blue boundary sort of um, overlapping the watershed is actually the Catskill Park um, on this map. But in any event, we, we, we got a lot of calls saying, you know, we should be banning fracking in the watershed. but. Um, took a very conservative approach and said, we don't know enough about that um, to make a decision without learning more. So we retained um, geologists and environmental scientists to look at the risks um, and evaluate what, what the risks were. They did a rapid impact assessment in just a few months um, to sort of identify what risks we really needed to worry about. So there were a few different categories. We were worried about the risk of physical damage to our water supply infrastructure and then a variety of potential impacts to water quality uh, from industrialization of our mostly forested watershed, um, from chemical spills, from wastewater, and from subsurface migration of the contaminants, which um, my co-panelists have spoken about, the uh, fracking fluids themselves, the uh, radioactive materials that come up. Um, and uh, we also looked at impacts to water quantity. Um, Fairly quickly, though, uh, we in eliminated water quantity impacts and have really focused on uh, water quality and on um, the risk to the infrastructure. So when we prepared the final impact assessment in December of 2009 and submitted comments on the state's first draft supplemental environmental impact statement on this topic, um, we called for a ban against fracking in the watershed and within seven miles of our water supply infrastructure. Um, it took a little while, but eventually the state actually agreed with us and in 2011 proposed to ban fracking in our watershed and in the other unfiltered watershed in uh, the state, which is Syracuse's watershed. These are the red-orange areas. Um, and the state went farther and, and proposed to ban fracking in state parks, the green areas, and over primary aquifers, the, the blue areas. Um, however, the DEC did not propose to ban fracking around our infrastructure. Um, instead, they suggested a heightened review if a well pad was within 1,000 feet of an aqueduct. Um, our aqueducts are large. They're lined with unreinforced concrete. Um, and they, uh, th there's no comparable situation that we're aware of anywhere in the nation or in the world where you've got 
hydraulic fracturing right in the vicinity of infrastructure that looks at all like this. Um, so again, because we didn't want to just base our, um, our, our, our comments on the, the revised proposal on sort of gut reactions, we went and um, hired some geophysicists and seismologists to help us understand better the potential risks here. And so we've been looking um, obviously at the potential for direct penetration of the tunnels, which would be catastrophic, but at a number of other potential risks to the infrastructure that wouldn't likely be catastrophic in and of themselves, but which over time can cause significant damage, which cumulatively decreases the amount of water that we can move and vastly increases the cost of delivering water to the system, uh, to, to the city. Um, we're embarking now, quite independent of fracking, obviously, on a program to uh, fix one of the leaks in one of our aqueducts. It's going to be $2 billion. It's a, a, a program that's going to take a decade, $2 billion, and that's to address cracks that have emerged over time without fracking happening. However, these aqueducts really are not, uh, are, are, are not built to withstand the differential pressure, having um, pressure from an area of hydraulic fracturing um, doesn't necessarily move the earth itself, but it does affect this unreinforced concrete lining of the aqueducts. The tunnels weren't designed for that. They were designed to deal with water inside, not pressures coming from the outside. Um, the tunnels also are, are vulnerable to the induced seismic activity associated with fracking. Um, we think that um, it, there's been a lot of evidence over the last few months in particular of um, a high volume hydraulic fracturing causing relatively small earthquakes. These are not the kinds of earthquakes that are going to cause catastrophic damage, but they are damaging earthquakes. And we, the aqueducts are in an area that is seismically active already. Um, the state's environmental review has vastly understated the number of faults in the vicinity of the infrastructure um, and the potential for damage to our tunnels from, from earthquakes. Um, we continue to be concerned about um, the, the potential here for if for subsurface contamination, although the state now discount, discounts that danger. Um, but mostly what we want to do is make sure that the ban in the watershed is supported, that the um, low volume wells, which are not in fact covered by the current environmental review, um, are not um, essentially induced by the ban in the watershed. Um, arguably the reason that low volume hydraulic fracturing is not currently an issue in the Marcellus Shale is that it, the costs of building the infrastructure to transmit it are too high. But if water, if fracking starts to happen in the, in the region and the infrastructure is built, then it may be that low volume fracking is more appealing in areas where high volume is banned. So we want to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, but mostly we focused on the infrastructure itself. And so one last map, um, which shows our current proposal. Um, so the green again is the um, watershed itself. Um, the purple it shows the areas around our aqueducts that are not in fact in the watershed. Um, and it shows our call for a ban of seven miles around, an absolute ban of seven miles around the, in, the aqueducts that actually bring water to the city, an absolute ban of two miles around the aqueducts that move water within the system, and then an enhanced protection zone um, between two and seven miles around those, that second category of aqueducts. Um, this, it, it's also important to keep in mind that the measurement of these buffers has to be from the horizontal extent of a, of, of a well rather than from the well pad. Uh, so there are a number of very significant issues that we continue to have uh, with the state's proposal here. Um, and again, as I said, I'm an advocate for New York City's water supply, and I'm, I'm not looking at the broader issues of whether fracking should happen in New York State at all. Um, instead, I'm really focused on what 
what can be done to ensure that whatever happens in the rest of the state, our water supply is protected. So the modest increase in the um, amount of the state that would be off limits to fracking under our revised proposal, um, it, it seems well worth it. This, this would leave roughly 8% of um, the Marcella Shale off limits because of our water supply, which seems well worth that, especially in light of the analysis we've heard before. Good evening. Um, based on what we've heard so far tonight, I, ha I had come tonight with a couple of questions, um, and I have some more now. But um, the first thing that I'd like to ask to the, to the panelists here are, given the fact that, um, um, we, that we're discussing, if we are discussing a, a future where fracking happens in New York State, we're discussing a future in which it's, um, regulated and as best regulated as the state and the city can manage and that for the past 10 or so years fracking has flourished in states like Texas, Wyoming, Colorado uh, under the the auspices of the loophole in the Clean Air Act that have allowed it to uh, operate with minimal regulation. Do you think that, um, in the simplest way to put it, do you think that the fracking industry could survive regulation in New York State? And if it couldn't, does it represent a good investment for the state of New York to support its development? As we've never seen the industry flourish in a state that has employed as strict regulations as we would hope New York State would employ if fracking went forward. <laughs> we moved two mics in your direction. I'm not sure what that means, Al. <laughs> Well, I'm not clear what you, what your picture of this future is. Um, all right, I got it here. The clearly the industry can't afford to do it right. I mean, the industry, you know, once projected it needed five dollars a TCF to do it to make mm -hmm. money. It's getting a dollar eighty per TCF now. Mm -hmm. um, they're desperate to e export. Um, so clearly, um, a. De a a decision to really enforce the proper regulations would essentially shut down the industry. Mm -hmm. But I don't really believe that once you authorize the industry, particularly given the food fight mm -hmm. we've been having over this, the state would have the nerve, um, you know, you, know the, you have to be a pretty gutsy regulator, which I was, I kind of fancy I was, but most of the other people are not. Um, and the, so uh, the, the larger question, though, for the state of New York is really, uh, why does it want this? I mean, outside the fact that you've clearly got what I would call old-fashioned thinking about energy, why do they want this? I mean, first of all, this is a formula for civil war upstate. Um, as you heard Hillary talk about, any farmer who's near this thing is living in mortal terror that this is going to go through. Um, the, you know, there's enormous, op there's enormous landscape opportunities, all the impartial economic analysis, the state withdrew its own economic analysis because it was shot to pieces, show that there's no benefit from the, um, you know, people ask me who would, who might benefit from this industry. I like to say motels that rent hotel rooms by the hour will benefit greatly from this, you know, this transient male workforce, but outside that, it's, um, <laughs> You know, don't invest a lot. You know, there are people in Pennsylvania who invested a lot of money in housing and restaurants and are now going belly up as the industry pulls back because it can't afford to do the, make, fulfill the drilling promises it's made. So, I, you know, I think, you know, I think the challenge for people like Cuomo is to look at what they could accomplish with alternate energy. Um, if I wanted to run for president, I would not want to be, I would not think I prove I'm pro-business by tailing in the wake of the gas fracking industry. I would think I prove I'm pro-business by creating a whole new industry. Um, and that's really the opportunity the state of New York has. Now, one will never go broke underestimating the fear of the average American politician. Um, <laughs> 
the we're, we've got a lot of people who are afraid of change. Okay, I can only tell them that you know you heard the number from my colleague from Corp Council, who I'm looking at with great affection. I did 30, I was a good client. I did 34 lawsuits with Corp Council and won them all. Um, the but the number she used 1.1 million gallons of water. If we'd be here in 1990, that number would have been 1.5 billion yeah. gallons of water. The city of New York, in several short years, <laughs> cut its water usage by 30 percent. This, these things can be done. I mean, we, when we talk about retrofitting buildings, mm -hmm. um, you know, it is, what does Thoreau say? It is through want of enterprise and faith that men are where they are, you know, buying and selling and living their lives like surf. There's a lot of failure of enterprise and faith. And there's, you know, there's a real crisis of leadership in this country. Um, but there's no question, technically, we could do this. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no question that there's enough people like Ashoke wandering around you know, who know how all the numbers add up, you know, that we could do this. Um, so from my point of view, the state of New York should, as I say, should learn how to add and should learn how to do diligence and should, you know, accept those conclusions. The one thing I might add is that it's not, it's, it's not only a question of guts, it's also a question of money. The State Department of Environmental Conservation has been, the, the funding has been cut to a point that it's just ludicrous. The, the senior staff have all left based on buyouts. The staff who are there at this point are overworked. They have 67,000 comments on fracking, and under CICRA, they actually have to respond to every substantive comment before they can move forward. Um, it, the, the, number of people actually there to do any work, to do any oversight, is scandalously low. And they're, they're painfully aware of that. Yeah, if I could make a, if I could, when we did the watershed program for the city of New York, we hired 400 new people. Um, inspectors, planners, water quality experts, scientists. Lawyers. Um, monitors <laughs> and lawyers too. Um, I'm a lawyer. Um, the. So that's, a, that's the kind of level of effort you have to be prepared to make. Now, the governor has tossed around, you know, the governor's made some promises that we will staff up if we're going to do this, but their idea of staffing up um, is not, I don't, I don't think it's very, also, if you're familiar as I used to be with government budgets, the, you know, if they staff up in fracking, I believe a lot of those people are gonna wind up filling in gaps that have been cut, you know, for other budget reason. So um, you can't fight a you know, my colleague is exactly right. You can't fight a war without an army. But it is at the end of the day a matter of guts. Um, you know, the, you know, never mind, I'm just thinking of Donald Trump, but be that as it <laughs> uh, Go ahead. Question. Oh, um, well, I had one more question, then we should go to the, um, which was directed at a couple different things people were talking about. Um, I was wondering how people see it s sort of going forward, whether or not there's, what the, or more importantly, what's the best way for the sort of hardline ban fracking movement and the more sort of complex, sometimes more integrated into the, the power structure in the state, regulate fracking or uh, pro-renewable energy sort of system to, to sort of collaborate and move forward in terms of creating the best possible future, the sort of model in my head being um, the way that currently uh, the New York Department of Buildings and, and the USGBC is sort of working on this sort of moving up the bottom line, moving up the top line, moving up the bottom line, moving up the top line. How can those two sort of parties collaborate and get the best possible future out of this situation? I think they should join together and work for renewables. All right. I endorse that wholeheartedly. I mean, I do think that we need to channel, I mean, we need to keep the energy level as high as possible, but we do need to channel some of it because we would really welcome the help because we're not, gonna, we're not succeeding on the renewable side because we don't have the army of people banging on doors saying, mm -hmm. let's do renewables, let's do solar. It's just not there. So the experts saying it and other people saying it is not gonna be enough. 
<clears throat> and so I think the, the plea, and I think we've started to kind of start, that's starting to happen. I do think that we need to really uh, do that, and it's hard. I mean, it's, I mean, again, you know, the energy efficiency and renewable stuff is, you know, there's a lot of, I know people, everybody supports it. Everybody who's opposed to fracking supports that. The question is how do we get that mm -hmm. really organized in a much more effective way to uh, really let the governor's office know that the people actually, the passion and the energy that people have put into opposing something is also there for supporting something. And that's a part of it just, I think, how we are. We, it's easy, we tend to want to get energized about what we are against, but, uh, and this is just part of the, I don't know what it is, but I do think that would be a huge, huge, uh, you know, pivot uh, that would, even in the coming, I would just say in the coming weeks even, I mean, we think there is an opportunity to get the solar bill done in the next four to six weeks. If there was uh, the, you know, if there was just even a inkling that there was more support for it out there in the general public. And uh, because I don't think we have that communicated yet uh, to, the, uh, to the public officials. Well, let me just say, I think there's, I think, you, I, hope, I hope you'll be pleasantly surprised. There's a lot of discussions in the fracking group yeah. about, you know, alternate, you know, about green energy. I have to say, though, Ashok, I think the green energy people are not helping themselves in the sense that there's too much confusion on small issues. Um, like, I just read a proposal about wind power that basically ignored all the controversies over siting. Um, you know, that are gonna take place. And many of the people, for example, who are opposed to fracking have the same kind of fears about wind power. Now, there's been a bad habit of, in, the, um, in the green movement of giving these concerns the back of the hand. I mean, I actually like NIMBYs. I wouldn't trust anybody who didn't love their own backyard. <laughs> um, the, so I think, I think, I think, I think the green energy movement needs to do some better job at kind of getting, doing, doing some agenda setting. The other thing, quite frankly, is the economics of this, and this is where I think people like the controller have a role to play. Um, the investment economics um, of this are not, are not very apparent to the public. I mean, they mostly see renewables in terms of what I will say, you know, tax credits and subsidies that, you know, bear a suspicious resemblance to the tax credits and subsidies we give fossil fuel. Um, now clearly fossil fuel gets a lot more money than renewables, and one of the first things we should be doing is pushing to get all of these subsidies taken out of fossil fuel and put on renewables. Um, but I think, you know, going back to the agricultural thing, th there has been an enormous failure in this state to think about economic development in any kind of sophisticated manner. The traditional economic development proposal in the state is let's build some big park and throw a lot of tax breaks at um, some company that will come in and you know we'll be able to say they're gonna employ a lot of people. You know, what's going on up at Saratoga is a really good example of this. Um, but the kind of very small precise things that would do things like sponsor agriculture or help green energy um, the, we haven't made those easy to do. Um, we haven't kind of contested, you know, there's lots of orthodoxies around now, and some of the orthodoxies about economic development are some of the worst of them. Um, the, you know, in New York people think economic development, they think real estate development. So. I like what I like what you said, Ashok, at the beginning. If we want to, if we want cheap energy, why do we waste so much of it? I mean, I think that that strikes me as kind of a you know I like I like counterpunching. I think that's a very good I think that's a very good theme, and it's the right question. Um, I think a lot of these questions on renewables. I mean, the, the line I always get the most rapport is I basically tell people, which I think everyone here knows instinctively, fossil fuel is the past. Renewables are the future. We need to kind of link, you know, people like being linked to the future. We need to do a better job of linking our, this picture of the future in renewables than we are doing. Um, and we have that, 
as I said, you know, we went to the moon in a, in ten years. We went to, to we went to Berlin in five. Um, this is a country that can do these things, and we need to restore kind of the hopefulness about this agenda. Just one other corollary. I, mean, I do think that yeah, we among ourselves can fight about the perfect way to do renewables. I mean, some of us have really spent a lot of time trying to craft the best bill we think we can get passed and done. We could also be our own worst enemy if people think, I have a better way to get solar done faster and more and not actually build on what we can get done and then get more later. So I think we also need to be among ourselves, be willing to say, let's move forward with what we can right now. And because we know that what we've put together and the coalition we put together is not perfect, but it's further along than anything else. And if we don't get behind something that can get done in the near term, because we're going to argue among ourselves about something that could be done better, more perfectly, uh, we're also shooting ourselves in the foot. And we have a tendency to want to do that, too. So I think when it comes to things like you know, efficiency and solar and wind, and Al, you're right, we don't always get it right. But we don't always get it wrong, either. And we need to kind of move forward and agree to get behind what others are doing as a way to make progress, even if it's not perfect. And I think we have a tendency sometimes to not do that and feel like if I don't get the perfect feed-in tariff solar bill, then no other solar bill is worth doing. Well, we, yeah, that, this, the, you're raising a whole series of interesting tactical questions. And you're raising a really interesting set of questions about the role of vision in politics, which someday the new school, I'm sure, will have a forum on, oh, yeah. and we'll, Every day. we can both come and talk about. <laughs> can I, I would so like can, to add something, go ahead, Hillary. and that is that I think there's um, uh, a really important parallel between the uh, sort of American quest for cheap energy and the American quest for cheap food. And that what the food movement's really been able to achieve um, over a lot of decades is a lot of small stuff happening in a lot of places that finally spilled over um, into the you know into policy so we could really see things happening you know in a broader way but um, we don't have that kind of time that we took all those years to really build the food movement and but I'm wondering if you know part of what we really have to uh, do as we're trying to move the ball for forward is to support as many kind of demonstration projects as we can in different parts of the state and even in different parts of the city. And I don't know exactly how that would happen, but a lot of it is probably going to come from private sector, not-for-profit uh, kinds of efforts. Um, but if there was money around, um, I could see the government also participating. But Well, part of the problem, the environmental movement is charmingly anarchic. Uh, it is a real problem with leadership, and what what Ashok is talking about is the leadership to kind of uh, what did Robert E. Lee say? It, you know, we should all go in together, and you know that's kind of you know that's what Ashok is talking about. We should all go in together. Better outcomes. And, and I just want to pick up on on Hillary's point um, and and. S suggest, I think this is a, a theme that's underlying a lot of what people are saying, is that education, communication, and transparency are really essential to this, that, that the message um, ends up being extremely garbled because of misinformation. And I, I mean, I think an example, which I'm sure you will appreciate if you don't already know this, is that the Delaware County Board of Legislatures recently adopted a resolution saying, OK, we get it that the city may want fracking banned in Delaware, in the portion of Delaware County in the watershed to protect water quality. And in exchange for that, they should pay us $80 billion over the next 50 years <laughs> for the losses to the good people of Delaware County and the farms here, which otherwise would be making all of this money from fracking. And, and I think it's a perfect example of the lack of communication on this subject. Yeah. We, we should get some uh, some questions from the audience, but and I have to ask you to use the microphones just because they are recording it. So if you don't mind, or there's some people here who can do that, but it is a it is a rare um, uh, panel discussion that you can you can actually leave and do something about. But if you do not, this is a little plug for NRDC. But you can go to the NRDC website 
They will direct you through their site to, con how to contact your legislature on, the, on the legislature on this Solar Jobs Act. There, there are only about 50 of us, I counted, but 50 is, 50 is better than no nobody doing it tonight. So all 50 of us can go get started you know, at the end of this thing, just go to the site and do that. There's a question. I saw somebody. 50 are mostly. That's right. So, sorry, as a plug for you guys. <laughs> it's a good sign. Hello, um, Oscar, Brad. <laughs> That's my name. It's, it's very, you know, there's a fine line here on the, on the, uh. <laughs> So my question is directed at Professor Apple. Um, for the past 18 months, um, we've been marked with global social movements. And for the past seven months, they've come, or in the past seven months, they've come to the United States in the form of Occupy Wall Street. Today you said, or today you asked, uh, will the industry play ball, meaning the global, I mean the natural gas industry, and then you went on to say that um, the industry is driven by institutional and financial pressures, which I took to mean the expectation of cheap natural gas and the expectation of um, like profiteering, um, more so than technical pressures. So what is the intersection of this global populist movement or these social, these global pressures and these financial institutional pressures? Well, I think the, first of all, I think gas fracking has been a marvelous populist movement in this state. And it's a movement that's been extremely sophisticated. I mean, this is, you know, um, this is a movement that's raised some very important issues about industry financing and about um, the tactics the industry is using and its accountability and, you know, about the relationship of government to those it's supposed to be regulating. So. I think, I think what you're seeing in this, this global movement is a crisis of legitimacy with government. That is the, you know, my mother used to say that there's three, there's three things that drive all human behavior, greed, lust, and the desire for power, but the worst of these is greed. And we have a government that's put itself in, you know, under Bush and others, you know, at the service of greed, basically. And we've seen the consequences and in the income inequality and the many other problems in this country that have been left and directed. And so what's happened is I think if you look at an issue like gas fracking, a bunch of people like yourself basically said this cannot be born. You know, we're not going quietly into that good night. And, you know, they mobilized and they organized and they, you know, we were talking about accountability and information. They put out information. They demanded accountability. You know, and now there's a good chance we will get a ban in the state of New York. If not, you know, by action of the DEC, then, you know, by the loyal suits that will undoubtedly follow if they're foolish enough to go down this path. So I see, you know, what's happening in gas fracking is, you know, a real cry to core by the people who live upstate, you know, who are basically saying, you know, we don't want this. This will be terrible for us, and you have to pay attention. And you know, the question, you know, for, you know, the, the government of the state of New York, for the legislatures who are trying to dance around the issues, whether or not they will, in fact, pay attention, whether they will listen um, to the, you know, to the teachers who sunk their retirement savings into this landscape, or the people of Cooperstown, or the people of Tompkins County, or the wine growers in the Finger Lakes, who have the same rights, I might add, you know, as the farmers who claim that they are, you know, you know, the, the victim of kind of radical environmentalists. The basic rule on property rights in the United States of America is your rights end when they interfere with the rights of, the, of others. Um, and that the government always has the right to regulate property rights to protect the public good. Um, you know, I used to get statements like that up in the watershed too, you have to pay us $80 billion. <laughs> Um, I would say, allow me to explain to you the due process clause of the American Constitution. <laughs> um, the, the first thing in the world that was ever regulated in the 19th century laissez-faire economies was water. The British woke up one day and decided they were tired of people dying of cholera. Um, and so they went, you know, and the whole, you know, I, I remember when I, had a, when I first became commissioner, I had a big argument with the her boss, the corporate consul, because the post office wanted to build a, you know, a freight handling fa facility right on the Kensico Reservoir. And, you know, corp consul at that time was kind of scared, um, 
you know, to challenge the post office and how it happened in court. I said, not to worry, folks. Well, you know, water regulation, you know, courts get it, and they got it. Those people are safely ensconced in Yonkers now. Um, the, so <clears throat> I think, you know, I think what, I think fracking is, I think the fracking movement is a great story. I think the fact that there are people like Josh Fox who basically said, I want to find out what's going on here. You know, I don't know how many people have seen Gasland. You know, the you know Gasland ne you know nearly won an Academy Award um, and did win the Sundance Award for Best Documentary. The industry hates the movie, and I've listened to many in industry people talk about the fact, you know, that Gasland isn't scientific. You know, it isn't analytical in the way, you know, academics and research paper. But what Gasland is, and I think this is the ultimate answer to your question. Gasland is a movie about the human face of gas fracking. And it's that human face of gas fracking that if we are continue to hammer it, I think we will win this. Thank you. I, yeah, I have a quick question. Somebody, somebody said something about the state has leased its public land. How could they get out of the leases if, the, if it's banned across the state? Well, to be blunt about it, there's no law that says if you lease land and the regulator, regulators say you can't do it, um, you don't get to do it. Even if it's the government sponsor. Even if it's the government. The, now, you should know in Pennsylvania, the, the state of Pennsylvania, which is to be, you know, I'm happy to say this in public, is a closely held corporation of the natural gas industry. Um, the state of Pennsylvania has leased about a third of its state forests to the gas industry. And the hunters and fishermen are going berserk over what's happening, you know, uh, to their particular areas. So I think the state of New York looked at that and learned it. We also have a docu doctrine in the state of New York, you can't alienate parkland, which has been a big help, you know, to us in allowing the state office of parks to essentially fend <laughs> off the gas frackers. I have another question, too, which has to do with the boundaries on the watershed. I, I mean, I've read this, the Hayes and Sawyer report, and I believe that somewhere along in there it said that they found a plume of methane that traveled seven miles, and so that became like the, the amount of they space found it, that they, they found an underground using. fissure yeah. actually yeah. through which uh, they ba what the Hayes and Sawyer did is look at the the, the 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 geological record and how long the fissures were in the shale. The end is, this is where the, one of the kinds of things that you know makes me kind of feel that the industry does not want to play in this game with a full deck, which is the industry keeps going around saying shale's this, you know, impervious, mm. you know, solid rock non -permeable layer. Whatever, yeah. And, and outside the fact that, you know, gas does move through shale, though very slowly, it's riddled with fissures in this part of the world. And what the Hayes and Sawyer study did is looked at the length of the fissures, seven miles. Now, when we built the, the Delaware Aqueduct, we had plumes of methane essentially accumulate against the aqueduct. They had problems with methane explosion, methane accumulating, methane infiltration into the construction works. So, you know, this, you know, we're confidently hoping, you know, that if DEC doesn't do the right thing, the city will sue on this issue. Um, you know, and they will be under a great deal of pressure from us water buffs to do so. But I guess the question is, you know, why seven, mi seven miles? Why not 50 miles? Yeah. Perfectly good question. I, uh, I think, you know, the, I think that, to tell you the truth, I think the city is up again. I've told Carter Strickland this. I think the city is up against the old bureaucratic thing that you got to appear to be reasonable. Okay? And... You know, then they've got, they know they have to say something about a limit. So seven miles, you know, seven miles is the length of, is the estimated length of, a, seven miles will pick up an estimated 90% of all the fissures. So that looks, you know, that's, that's their way of trying to be reasonable. The city's always been, in my view, I mean, I was always criticized for being a little too, too cavalier about this, but, has always been my view a little too touchy about upstate sentiment. 
you know, one of the things that I think you may want to remember is it was not the city of New York who passed the 1905 Catskill Watershed Act. It was the upstate legislatures who passed it. And the reason is they did not want to kill the New York City goose that was laying the golden eggs, you know, of patronage funding. In the immortal words of George Washington Plunkett, New York City is pie for the hayseeds in Albany. Um, <laughs> And that's where, you know, that's where the 1905, I used to point that out, you know, to a very cold reception. You know, friends <laughs> yeah. But, you know, facts are stubborn things. And, you know, we have to be factual about all of this stuff. And, and where we can't be factual because there are no absolute facts. There is no, it, the, the, we certainly haven't found any expert who is willing to say that there is a number where it's completely safe, a, a, a buffer zone where if that were the buffer zone, there would be no risk. So uh, recognizing my colleague's uh, dislike of balance as a goal, it's about risk tolerance. And, and this is, a, it, it's, a, it's a judgment call when you don't have an absolute fact um, you have to look at the facts you do have and, and exercise some judgment. Yeah, but of course what the city should be doing in this instance is supporting the ban, because the way to solve this problem is we have a ban on um, gas fracking in the state of New York. You know, the Bloom, you know, this is not true of DP, and I don't think it's true of Corp Consul, but it is true that in the mayor's office, they've, I think they've been a little too concerned to keep, you know, keep their interest in the watershed even though we, I think, as a city, have a vested interest in the long-term energy policy of the state, which gas stacking threatens. And also in the food from the state. Yes, we have a, we have a huge interest in that. In terms of the methane, uh, how did you take care of the aqueduct uh, issue of methane explosions and all when you were building that? Uh, basically, um, you know, basically they pumped it out, they went around it, um, they were careful where they went. Um, there were construction, you know, there are construction techniques for doing this. Um, but people forget concrete is porous, okay? The, the idea that concrete is not porous is not true. I mean, things, things basically can migrate through concrete. It's always a problem with odor at sewage treatment plants that the concrete on top of the you know, the digester tanks will bleed out certain chemicals. So the, 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 lining in the, the lining in the aqueducts is supposed to prevent that kind of infiltration. The question then becomes whether the lining can take the pressure if you begin to get a plume of m methane beginning to build up underground against it. I have a, a question about activism, going back to activism. And I think it was your comment about we got to take half a loaf or a quarter loaf or whatever we can get in order to get more and to build on something. And I think that um, I'm just wondering what your feelings are about comparing this to the civil rights movement. We have a, an agenda here that needs to be addressed for the equality of how we deal with energy as we go into the future. And if we don't get away from fossil fuels and if we don't go to green energy, we're going to stop the rights of many of the citizens in this country in order to survive. Literally, it's about survival. So it, it basically, it's like telling Obama, look, you shouldn't run because it's not your time yet because you may get hurt or it may not be time for us to have a black president. Well, he said, screw that. I'm going to run and I'm going to become president. I think that it's time that we take a, a, a harder look at the course that we take and action that we take in order to accomplish the vision that we have here. And I just, I just think it's more appropriate to go ahead and fight the fight. And it's almost like we need a Martin Luther King or somebody like that. Like Al is, Al is a good candidate for that, although I don't think he wants to roll. Um, but I really think there, there needs to be a more aggressive uh, action taking to to accomplish energy, energy independence, and it's not about drilling for gas. I think my I mean, the question is, you know, yes, a 5,000 megawatt solar bill is not enough, and the question is if people think we can get a 10,000 megawatt bill passed, I would be all for it. So, uh, I, you know, my view, yeah.
Yeah, well, let me just say something about that. I think to the extent I have a uh, political complaint with the renewables, it's, I don't think they've given us, you know, they haven't given us the actionable vision, but this gets back to the question of leadership. Ultimately, you know, when you're down in the pits politically, it is a tactical choice of what to take. And I think people have to be willing in, you know, assuming that you do not make a choice that compromises a future that can go forward. You know, if you kind of look at the, um, if you look at kind of the gay rights movement, for example, I mean, basically, um, you know, they started off by blocking the federal, you know, Defense of Marriage Act by saying, let's take this issue to the states. You know, and they kind of stuck the conservatives with it because the conservatives were big states' rights people. You know, and then they went state by state. And they've been very effective in picking off, you know, individual states. And they went state by state. They made a deal in this state to essentially give four Republican senators, several of whom I'd like to get, frankly, a pass because they voted you know, for the right issue. Those are, you know, you can articulate a vision and, you know, still work with the kind of leadership that can make those kinds of tactical choices. Um, whether one, you know, we, the problem, of course, is we are a democracy. Um, you know, nobody is nominating any of us for philosopher king. And whether we like it or not, we have to persuade the people who are wedded to fossil fuel. You know, to get you know to get their act together and do the right thing, and sometimes that's an incremental process. I have a question about just that. The, in the interest of buying time, and the incremental process on a critical point of the issue, which I think everyone could agree on, is uh, the importance of human health. Uh, if a certain contingent couldn't hear about how the non-human animals are coping with this, or even how the land, well, let's talk about human animals. Uh, in your, your opinion, do you feel that the, a good linchpin to buy more time in the meantime would be to uh, force the hand of the governor's office to admit the human health study before any uh, movement towards allowing fracking to happen around our watersheds began? And if not, what would you say would be a good place to put pressure? Well, I have to say, I mean, part of the reason I got involved in this movement, I was appalled at the thought, you know, that people would be politically so irresponsible as to consider fracking in the watershed. You know, and then I got pulled into more aspects of the issue. But the truth of the matter is, people are dismissing the health issue. Yeah, it's very, it's very, to me, it's very shocking, personally, you know. Um, like we have the Spectra pipeline, there's been no good analysis in the Spectra pipeline of the potential radon implications, you know, of bringing, you know, this kind of Marcellus shale gas into the city of New York and then burning it in everybody's stove. And what, but the, you know, I think part of the frustration people have who are committed to the kinds of concerns you've just expressed is how can people be so irresponsible as to ignore this? But they are. I mean, it's unfortunate, but they are. In fact, they kind of, you know, they kind of try and use this as an example of the hysteria. Um, you know, it's, if people aren't dropping off dead, over dead, people somehow think there's no kind of health implication. Um, you know, if you go back and look at the first 20 years of the anti-smoking debate, people weren't dropping over dead with lung cancer, therefore there was no issue. Then, of course, they started dropping over dead and you know, we learned, but the, it, as I say, it's very, it's extremely depressing. I mean, the industry likes to go around saying, hey, this fracking fluid can't be all that bad. It, you know, it's only one, five, it's only half a percent of the liquid or chemicals. Okay, but if you look at the, the toxicities of those chemicals, they're not expressed in parts per hundred, they're expressed in parts per million. And sometimes they're even expressed in parts per billion, which means fracking fluid would kill you if you drank it, you know. Um, but you don't get that, uh, you don't get that kind of acknowledgement from, you know, the industry. You get kind of the same kind of, you know, you know, dull denial that we got, you know, that we've had in the smoking debate and the asbestos debate and the PCB debate and, you know, um, you know, I don't. We're, we're not a country that deals well with toxins. 
The Europeans have, a, have a, had a great right to know Bill, and the way they got it is Greenpeace went around and stopped people in the street and said, can we test your body tissue for how many toxins you're carrying? They found an average of 83 toxins per person. That is, you know, whether if you're a woman, it's in your breast milk, if you're a man, it's in your semen, um, you know, it's in your body flesh. Um, I give my sustainability class the following Quite, you, the following kind of issue in sustainable economics. You're being used for garbage disposal. Shouldn't you be paid for this? <laughs> I, I also think there's a timing issue here. Um, it, at the moment, the prospect of jobs is so extraordinarily appealing that even if there isn't a whole lot to back it up, the industry's claims that this is a jobs program is is what people want to hear right now and that actually is more compelling than health impacts I, I, it's it's largely a function of just the moment we happen to be facing this issue in I think I think one of the things that we really have to deal with is where is our this information coming from I mean it's pretty clear that the industry whatever the industry is going to tell us is going to you know be designed to lead people to believe that that fracking is not harmful. If they're better communicators than we have. Well, they have a lot more money on their side than we do, but I still think they don't that. Argue as much money <laughs> but obviously, people, the public has to learn how to evaluate the information and, and where it's coming from. Okay, we, have, I, we can take one more question if somebody has the microphone there. Yeah, hi. Um, my question, I think, is for Ashok. Sure. Um, take two more questions, if there's, yeah. <laughs> there's too much disappointment in that last. <laughs> So um, I'm, a, I'm an environmental engineering PhD student at Columbia, and I, my focus is on the mitigation side, and I'm firmly in the, you know, what should we do? I'd be, I'm all in support of the, all the things that you're saying. Um, kind of as a hobby, I took on hydrofracking just to study it a little bit, to learn a little bit more about it after the Cornell paper had come out last, right around a year ago, because uh, I think it had some weaknesses to it or some areas that could be exploited if you were pro-hydro fracking. So since then, I've kind of gone through the process, and just from the things we know that there's publicly available data on, we, we understand where, the, where the, the, the known fugitive methane emissions come from just as part of the process. And fortunately, it's an old process, so there's lots and lots of data on under, you know, trying to understand the process itself. This excludes these, you know, methane bombs that travel eight miles away. This is just talking about what's part of the process in the pumps and the drilling and the redrilling. So once you understand what those emissions are, then you can kind of start to figure out what technologies you'd need to, if you wanted to fix that problem. And once you do that, you can put some costs to these known technologies. You start to see that it's, it's not even, it's not an affordable source for electricity compared to other baseload type. Um, sources. So my question is, from a climate change perspective, does this come up? You know, where, where is it in the climate change debate or the climate change policy side of things? I mean, I think the other problems are worse, the water and the earthquakes and all that kind of stuff, but where, do, where does climate change in this debate? I mean, the short answer on, I mean, I'll hold up. I mean, we just released a report called Leaking Profits. People should look for it on the website. I mean, basically, it did go through all of the technologies available to actually reduce those methane emissions. And so one can look at the issue of how much leakage there is and how much methane, and given its potent force, has an impact on climate. But are those things, are there things we could do about it? And so I think we kind of went through and looked at each of the technologies that could mitigate methane emissions from the natural gas production process and went, you know, and described all, and there are EPA regulations now pending on, on this oil and gas industry regulation on, on, the, on this topic. So I think there is a lot of information on what can be done to reduce those emissions. There's issues of cost and what would it cost to do so and how, you know, and that's a, the evidence there is very, you know, there's a lot of wide range in terms of the costs, but uh, so we are paying very close attention to the debate on climate of uh, issues of natural gas in terms of the full impact 
uh, of natural uh, of natural gas. So you know, people can find various blogs from my colleagues and others, and this paper called "Leaking Profits" that kind of got, went into the real details of the uh, the range of things one could do if one uh, could get the regulations in place to address that topic. So um, my question is in reference to you know, knowing that in the old days of getting fossil fuel out of the ground, you'd basically stick a pole in the ground, it would start gushing out, then you'd put it in barrels and sell it. And now it's at the point where companies are very, very seriously and already going into solid rock to try to squeeze out this bit of fossil energy that's there. And so my question is, where is the point at which these companies have to fundamentally change and say, okay, it can't be fossil anymore, it has to be something else, or they fail? And what does that look like? Well, I, if we were 20 years ago, we'd already be there. But the truth matters, the companies can charge a price that pays for doing things like tar sands. You know, there's a reason tar sands is triple the global impact of normal oil, because global warming impact, because it, it takes so much energy to get it. Um, there's a very good exhibit at Cooper last year called Landscapes of Extraction, which is kind of looking at the extreme strategies being used, you know, you know to pull out fossil fuel. I mean, clearly no one ever thought we'd be drilling 10,000 feet under the ocean. You know, which is what they're talking about doing in Brazil, you know, offshore to get oil. But oil is, you know, so valuable. And these companies basically, you know, want to stay in oil. They don't want to go into green energy. You know? I mean, all of them have a little bit of a portfolio in green energy, but it's, it's clearly only for PR purposes. Um, so a lot of people in our movement would like to see the world run out of oil because it would force everyone to you know, deal with reality, but I'm afraid the numbers suggest we're going the opposite way. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, Al and Hillary and Hillary and Lou and Ashok. Thanks very much. <laughs>